Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's virtual media briefing about COVID-19 in London and Middlesex County. We're glad to have you along with us. Also happy to be joined this afternoon by the Mayor of London, Ed Holder, the Warden of Middlesex County, Kathy burkhardt jessen the Medical Officer of Health at the Middlesex London Health Unit, Dr. Chris Mackey, and the Executive Vice President, Interim Chief Clinical Officer and Chief Nursing Officer at the London Health Sciences Centre, Carol young Ritchie. We're also happy to be joined this afternoon by you, members of the media, and we look forward to your questions. A reminder, if uh, perhaps even you're new to this virtual media briefing, to submit your questions, just click on the text bubble with the question mark in it here on Microsoft Teams. That will uh, submit your question, and when you do so, if you could indicate your name as well as your media outlet, and who your question is for. And finally, to those joining us on Rogers Television or the Rogers Facebook page or YouTube channel, listeners on Global News Radio 980 CFPL, and viewers on the CTV London website, we welcome you as well to our briefing this afternoon. Let's get to our opening remarks right away, and we'll start with Mayor Ed Holt. Well, thanks, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm encouraged to see relatively stable case counts continuing here in London Middlesex with flat to slightly lower case uh, counts across Ontario. The fact that we're seeing these numbers, even as students today begin their fourth week of in-class learning here in London, I think that's really a testament to the effectiveness of the vaccines and our ongoing commitment to responsible public health measures. Speaking of responsible, let me say that I am pleased to report that the vast majority of those at Western conducted themselves responsibly over the weekend. Many stayed away from Roughdale and surrounding areas, while those who did attend were generally respectful. However, it was a somewhat different uh, story during the evening and overnight hours on Saturday, specifically in the Huron Street area. During that time, I can tell you our bylaw enforcement officers responded to 24 noise complaints, several of which were referred to the London Police Service due to crowd size, and I anticipate they'll provide more information as it's available. As for earlier in the day, and again, these are in addition to whatever fines or charges were issued by police, our bylaw enforcement officers issued a dozen fines for noise, public nuisance party attendance, use of closed street and public urination. A number of other fines will be issued to individuals under the public nuisance bylaw for uh, <clears throat> as that goes forward. Uh, in addition, and based on evidence still being reviewed and collected, it's entirely possible we'll see additional change, uh, charges issued later in the week, including violations of the Medical Officer of Health's Section 22 order. I want to publicly acknowledge and thank all of our first responders, especially uh, the London Police Service, uh, other police service who, was, who were brought in, EMS, fire and bylaw enforcement for their efforts over the weekend. You know, monitoring that kind of activity with crowds in that kind of state is not an easy thing to do, but they did their jobs with great professionalism and dignity. So on behalf of all auditors, let me say thank you for helping us prevent the sort of chaos we've seen in other years. The most important outcome for where Roughdale is concerned is the fact that we had no reports of serious injuries. That's always a prime concern and ultimate objective. So for that, once again, thank you to the vast majority of Western students who get it, who acted appropriately, and to our dedicated first responders. That's it for me. Over to you, Warden Kathy. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mariette. And as always, it's great to be with uh, this Monday afternoon gang. Um, I want, I hope, trust that everybody had a good weekend. Um, over the weekend um, and into this morning, I did reach out to colleagues across the county and I'm pleased to report that for the most part, the requirement for proof of vaccination has largely been met with cooperation. Unfortunately, though, Unfortunately, though, there have been uh, the odd incident where patrons have aggressively pushed back to the staff asking for that proof of vaccination. Respectfully, I would ask those who do not agree with the, the requirements of entry that we all have to meet it to consider your behavior and attitude towards those doing what is required of them. There is no question that the pressures of living with the pandemic for the last 18 or 19 months is taking its toll. Emotions are high and it does feel like everyone is living on the edge. Throughout the pandemic, I have understood that there will always be differing opinions on what is happening, how it's being handled, and my message has never wavered. And while it might seem trite, 
my message will not change. Be kind and respectful to everyone. We all have choices as to how we are going to manage the situation in front of us and how we are going to get through this. I trust that working together, we will find our way through. We are just about there. I can see the end of this. And all we have to do is keep working together. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Mackey. Thank you very much, Madam Warden and uh, Mr. Mayor. Most of the comments I have to make today are housekeeping. Uh, we do see continued similar trends to the past in terms of case counts being relatively flat in the region and uh, the vaccine campaign continuing to vaccinate, you know, about 1% of the population each week, give or take a bit. Um, we have uh, we have reached an important milestone in all of our neighborhoods in Middlesex and London. There were some neighborhoods that had been falling behind from a vaccination perspective. Uh, we've now vaccinated uh, at least 65% of people in every neighborhood. Now, when you get down to the neighborhood level, there's a lot more uh, disparity in terms of mm -hmm. the vaccination rate. And so the fact that we've been able to bring even the, uh, the hardest hit neighborhoods up to 65% vaccination is something we should all be proud of. Uh, in particular, White Oaks and the, the two neighborhoods uh, around White Oaks, we're uh, among the last to reach that milestone. And the uh, White Oaks mobile vaccination clinic that has been in place for two weeks and will be in place for the next two weeks as well, uh, has been an important part of that. So that's tremendous. Uh, we've had a generally good response to vaccination passports the Section 22 orders, uh, working with operators have, have been generally quite positive there. I know uh, Dan is going to mention in a moment uh, some, some housekeeping items around the Health Unit website and our operations around September 30th, so I won't take his uh, thunder away there, but uh, hopefully that is some useful information and I'm happy to pass now to Carol young Ritchie. Thank you and good afternoon everyone and thanks for having me here again today to update on the COVID-19 situation at London Health Sciences Centre. As of this morning, we are caring for 13 COVID-19 positive inpatients and six of those within our critical care. We have, few, we have five or fewer of COVID-19 positive patients in Children's Hospital with five or fewer of those patients being in our pediatric critical care unit. Thankfully, we are not seeing large case numbers in our community but our current hospitalizations are a warning that we must continue to practice public health measures, including physical distancing, masking, and hygiene and vaccination. On the vaccine front, our medical affairs and occupational health and safety teams have been working tirelessly to reconcile our attestation rates with the submitted proof of vaccination. I'm pleased to share that it looks like the majority of our team are on track to meet the October 22nd deadline with 96% of our medical staff and 91% of our staff having submitted proof of being fully vaccinated. This is data as of last week and we expect those rates to increase over the next few weeks. In the past week, we've received a number of media questions asking about suspension or discipline for those staff and physicians that remain unvaccinated. Well, their number, well, our number, well, their numbers continue to decrease. Our current focus is on ensuring that those who are not fully vaccinated are antigen testing as per our policy, and we continue to encourage vaccination. No discipline is taking place at this time for anyone who is unvaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Dr. Mackey, Mayor Holder, and Warden burkhardt Jessen. We do have a lot of questions in the queue and a few uh, new folks joining us for the first time today on the virtual media briefing. So let's get to the questions right away. And we'll start with the first. It is from Brent Lale at CTV. Dr. Mackey, this one is for you. Uh, Dr. Mackey, do you believe increasing indoor capacity to 50% is a good idea? Yeah, thanks for the question, Brent. Uh, so I think you're referencing the announcement from the province on uh, Friday that they'd be increasing some uh, indoor capacities and also extending the vaccination mandate to new facilities. I think the fact that those two announcements and policy changes are happening together really mitigates any potential risk. We, you know, we, we have seen quite a level, uh, fairly flat response. The step three reopening did increase cases to a certain extent, but they've really leveled off. And so at this point, it's reasonable to 
uh, attempts, uh, other uh, moderate reopening with vaccine vaccine mandates in place, and any extension of the vaccine mandate, of course, is a good thing. So we are not overly concerned about that at this point, but of course, we'll be watching closely. Thank you very much. Let's go to our next question. It's from Jane Sims at the London Free Press. Uh, Dr. Mackey, the province says 88% of those eligible in the region have one dose of vaccine. And you said on your Twitter feed that you're predicting we will be at 90% by the weekend. Why are mobile clinics, such as the one at White Oaks Mall, making that much of a difference? There are two things right now, Jane. There are two things that are making a big difference. First of all, mobile clinics making the vaccine more accessible for people. Second of all, the vaccine mandates really making it clear to people that if you want to resume normal life, vaccination is the path. Those together are a powerful incentive for those that might have been sitting on the fence or delaying or otherwise occupied, you know, paying attention to other parts of their lives. Uh, so we're very happy about those two things. The, we're also very happy that the health unit is doing well compared to provincial and, and other health units. And again, uh, for all the partnership for from London Health Science Center, City of London, the County of Middlesex, uh, Middlesex London Paramedic Service, so many uh, individuals who have really uh, offered everything, blood, sweat and tears to try and make sure that this campaign can move forward as efficiently and effectively as possible in London and Middlesex. And uh, I know we've got a couple of follow ups here from Jane for you, Dr. Mackey. 90% uh, has been the magic number sought by public health since the vaccination campaign began. Can we expect that reaching this milestone plus the vaccine certificate program will lead to further loosening of restrictions this fall, even with the Delta variant still around? Great question, Jane. So we are starting to see some of those restrictions uh, eased. You, you saw that in the announcement on Friday, and that's clearly in part a reflection of the high vaccination rate. We'll be much happier when it's our second dose rate that is hitting 90%. Uh, at the moment, it's our first dose, and, and we know that second doses are extremely important when you talk about the Delta variant. And uh, last question here from Jane for right now. Uh, Dr. Mackey, the outbreak list on the COVID dashboard has grown now to five schools. Can you tell us about those outbreaks and if these are cases acquired in school? Are you worried about how many cases are showing up in schools? Also, given the reports last week from Pfizer and BioNTech that said their vaccine is safe for children, how soon do you think it will be before we start vaccinating kids here? Boy, Jane, uh, we sure hope that we are able to start vaccinating kids very soon. At this point, we have very small outbreaks in schools. The, the definition that we're using around an outbreak in school is a single case of transmission. So we are really setting the bar very low. Uh, anything where there's a link between two cases essentially is generating a, an outbreak. This doesn't mean that there is a huge number of cases in, in most of those schools. It's only you know less than five cases, uh, very small numbers. However, uh, we want to be on the safe side, take appropriate precautions, get those children isolated and tested to make sure we're stopping any additional spread. The rate in children is really not uh, concerning vis-a-vis -vis schools. The you know we, we're looking very closely at what impact school opening has had. The rate in children has really not changed since school opening. We saw the rate in children increase mid-August, which obviously was, you know, three weeks before school opening, and it's been essentially flat, just like the community rate has since then. What that means is that we don't have any evidence at this point that schools opening is causing additional transmissions. And, you know, in the situations where we're de de declaring outbreaks, uh, that doesn't change the, the fact that we're really not seeing schools kind of incre uh, increasing the net uh, spread of COVID among children. So that is all uh, very helpful to know, very reassuring around safety in schools. Of course, the numbers are increasing because, you know, time is passing and the children are largely unvaccinated. Obviously, when you get below age 12, very few children have had any COVID vaccines. So that's where we're seeing about twice as many cases as in the older children. And, uh, and that's why we feel so important to get the vaccine to those children as quickly as possible. Let's go to the next question. It's from Brent Lale at CTV London, and he's asking on behalf of Brian Bicknell. Uh, Carol, this one is for you. Uh, Carol Young-Ritchie, how many employees have been vaccinated and what is the rate? 
uh, for LHSC staff. Also, do you have any concerns about losing nursing staff over the mandatory vaccination policy in a time of dire need? Yeah, thanks, Jan. Um, I can't give you actual numbers, but I can give you percentages of the staff that have been fully vaccinated. So to date, our medical staff are 96% fully vaccinated and our staff are 91% fully vaccinated. So certainly uh, that's a concern of ours and we're collecting data on that and we'll look at the risks of that. What we're really focused on at this point is reaching out to all the staff who've not been vaccinated and offering any support we can. Uh, certainly we're a large research-based organization and looking to help those staff who might have questions and also reviewing uh, the exemptions that come through for medical exemption or human rights exemption. But certainly we don't wanna lose any of our team. Uh, everyone here is important in the work that we have ahead. Uh, but again, our focus is in supporting our staff and uh, I think those numbers are gonna be coming up. Thank you very much, Carol. Let's go to another question from Brent Lael. Uh, for Dr. Mackey, you've recommended workplaces implement mandatory vaccination policies. Does that apply to healthcare settings like hospitals and long-term care homes as well? Is the public put at greater risk when healthcare staff are not vaccinated? Well, absolutely, this applies to healthcare settings, including the Middlesex London Public Health Unit. And we do have a mandatory vaccination policy in place as to do you know most of the major healthcare organizations in our area of course healthcare workers being uh, unvaccinated would potentially put um, some of their vulnerable clients at risk it's really encouraging to see the high uptake we're seeing at Middlesex London Health Unit London Health Science Center and many other healthcare providers thank you Dr Mackey let's go to our next question um, this is a question from Norm De Bono at the London Free Press and this has come in via email. Uh, Norm's having some challenges with the connection with Teams this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Mackey, there are reports an anti-vax group attended a downtown restaurant over the weekend. Is the health unit investigating? What can we? What can be done? What action will be taken by the health unit? And if a member of the public has concerns about a business not following mask procedures, what can they do? And Norm would also like to hear from Mayor Holder on this as well. Uh, sure, I'm happy to uh, happy to comment, Dan. The health unit was made aware over the weekend of a restaurant that was not requiring vaccination passports in, in spite of the provincial legislation that did require this. Um, the health unit inspected and discussed with the operator, and that situation has been resolved. And the uh, operator is now requiring passports. There is a, a fine of $100,000 that is in the provincial regula regulations around this for businesses. For individuals, the fine starts at $750 and increases based on repeat offenses. For businesses, the fines start at $100,000. So it's quite a serious penalty and uh, uh, we're, we're grateful that the operator decided to begin to comply. Thank you very much. Mayor Holder. Uh, Mayor Holder, I believe you're on mute. Thanks, Dad, and thank you, uh, Norman, for the question. Uh, apparently, there was a social media post on this. I did not see it, but so I can speak more generally if I can. Uh, as we know, in in uh, in our city, like cities across the country, there are some individuals who don't think the rules apply to them, and what they're looking for is attention. I don't even want to give the chucklehead who thought this was a really clever idea. Uh, uh, credit by announcing his, his name. Uh, they're just not worthy. In fact, they do more harm to our community and they also do harm to those businesses because uh, as Dr. Mackey's mentioned, that fine is, is exceptionally significant. That would shut down probably most uh, businesses with that kind of fine. And obviously these people have a blatant disregard for, for the health and vitality of our economy and our community and our businesses therein. Certainly, we appreciate the great cooperation that restaurants and bars have shown in requiring vaccine passports, but it could be just as easily uh, someone who's just done a little uh, uh, jump in uh, uh, and out a guerrilla warfare kind of strike where they go in and get a picture taken and run. And they should run because these people don't deserve to be in our restaurants, bars and other events that require a, a passport. And frankly, they do a disservice to London. They do a disservice to region and to Canada. So I call them out. 
because that's just not appropriate, that kind of behavior. And I think anyone that, that chooses to participate in that should know the difference. But you know what? You, as I've said sometimes uh, before, you can't fix stupid, and this is really, really a stupid act. Thank you very much, Mayor Holder. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from Sophia Rodriguez at CBC London. Uh, that refer to homecoming over the weekend. Uh, Dr. Mackey, Sophia asks, given the videos of mass outdoor gatherings at night during homecoming, how worried are you about an uptick in cases among young people? Would you recommend that all students who attended get tested? Yeah, th thanks for the question, Sophia. You know, we've seen a number of large outdoor gatherings in this area uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. The difference with what you're seeing on, you know, Huron Street on this past weekend is that people aren't distancing, they're not masking. Being outdoors is generally quite protective, reduces your risk of COVID significantly. But if you're in significant close contact for a prolonged period without mask, that really negates the benefit of being outside. So it definitely is a concern. And, um, you know, given the number of people involved, it's quite likely that somebody there had COVID and it's quite possible that we would see spread related to that. And, and it, absolutely, if anyone who has been to those events has any symptoms whatsoever, they should be considered high risk and they should definitely get tested. Thank you very much, Dr. Mackey. Let's go to that next question from Sophia Rodriguez, and this, Mayor Holder, is for you. Uh, Mayor Holder, how many staff were deployed to assist with homecoming? Is there a known cost associated with monitoring and cleaning up? And how many fines were issued to individuals, tenants who violated COVID orders? Uh, Mayor Holder, I, I think your computer has gone back on mute. Sometimes that's better. Um, thanks, Sophia. I appreciate the question. Uh, I'll try to unpack it because there are several questions in there. In terms of uh, staff, firstly, you need to know that uh, senior levels of staff in all departments, uh, in most departments, were involved in high level discussions with all the players you might imagine from Western to um, our police uh, to the health unit and uh, paramedic services, uh, all with the all with the intention of ensuring that people were safe. And I'd like to commend our our city staff and all the participants who were involved in this. I think it's really an important initiative. Uh, you would know that we had uh, we had a full complement of bylaw enforcement officials. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the western area over the weekend uh, deployed in various uh, places um, in addition to our police and of course uh, the support services that went uh, with that as well and the great support of the health unit as far as the cost associated with the monitoring and the and the cleanup firstly uh, I don't have a, a final figure I know that last year by bringing in other police force right. support that cost uh, to the city was around three hundred thousand um, dollars uh, to keep uh, people safe and to um, and to keep uh, uh, and to keep the law and uh, so we don't have those uh, those costs uh, at this point in terms of that as far as cleanup um, you know I met with the University Students Council this past week and I threw a challenge out to them and I and I said I thought it'd be a great initiative by Western's uh, students because it's primarily Western students that make the mess to have a very formal and organized cleanup. Now we do know that some area residents do their own cleanup and some of those include students certainly, but to have a formally disciplined approach to that, I think would go a long way from the standpoint of goodwill. Uh, as far as uh, fines uh, issued, I think I addressed that in the my opening comments, but I would add that there certainly will be more to come and I'm confident that will come uh, uh, through the support of the uh, our bylaw enforcement folks, um, uh, the Section 22 orders issued by the health unit, and of course our poli local police. Thank you very much, Mayor Holder. And I am going to take a quick moment to um, just check with everyone. We do have it's a very busy Monday. We've got a lot of ground to cover, and we do have uh, a number of questions left. And I just want to make sure we're okay to go over into overtime with everybody. Okay, I think we're good to carry on then. All right, let's go to the next question. Uh, this one is for Dr. Mackey from Andrew Graham at Global News Radio 980 CFPL. Dr. Mackey, last week 
You mentioned that the health unit alerted Ontario's chief medical officer of health about a rise in COVID-19 cases among children that's been seen locally. Have you received an update since then? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. We did ask the uh, chief MOH to consider adding the COVID vaccines to the Immunization of School Pupils Act, which would make them you know, required for students along with many other vaccines that are already required. Um, we we haven't received a response on that particular aspect of the request, although you know the provincial um, office of the chief of MOH did reach out to ask what we were doing locally to address the issue. So we we did share you know the the work we've been doing to vaccinate in schools, the letters we've sent to the the schools and school boards about enhanced precautions uh, to keep children safe, and. Uh, we look forward to any further updates from the provincial government. Thank you very much. Let's go to uh, the next question. It is from James Sharani at CBC London for Mayor Holder and for Dr. Mackey. Over the weekend, a London restaurant was confronted by a former PPC candidate for enforcing the vaccine pass system and was later singled out on social media. Will there be any supports for small businesses who are enforcing the provincial vaccine pass who might find themselves in the same situation. I can start if you like, Chris, up to you. You'd probably be wiser though, but let me let me take a crack at it. I've I've spoken already about the issue of the individual who uh, who is who uh, is, is not to be named for their um, just bear with me while I just get a little silent. Thank you. I'm not going to give credit or acknowledgement of this individual by by mentioning their name. Uh, the arrogance uh, of those individuals is beyond words. Uh, but what I do have concern for is is small business uh, who is doing their very best to enforce uh, the rules and uh, find themselves in tough situations uh, where uh, individuals can be insistent about their quote rights. But I have not, to be fair, I have not heard uh, uh, personally of uh, situations where there have been altercations between uh, individuals wishing to make a point. I'm not even sure they want to uh, to uh, enjoy the benefits of, of those businesses as much as they want to make a fashion statement of their own design. So, uh, but as far as small business, one of the things that, uh, that uh, the police have committed to locally is to provide uh, support if there does get to be that kind of a scenario to uh, call the police and 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 they will address that right away. Um, as far as the the province actually doing something in their turn, um, at this point, I can't comment on that. I would direct those comments to the province. Yeah, Dan, I think uh, the mayor's nailed it on the head. It, we're certainly not going to hold businesses accountable if they have customers who are are refusing to follow the legislation. Uh, really, if if a situation like that arises, it is you know the business has to has to involve the um, the authorities, involve the police, especially if there's any uh, safety risk that comes out of it. Thank you, Mayor Holder. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Uh, let's go to our next question. It is from Holly Mackenzie Souter, uh, who is joining us from the Canadian Press this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Mackey, this one is for you. Has the health unit started planning? for COVID-19 vaccinations in five to 11 year olds. And can you share any details about what's being planned? For sure, thanks Holly, uh, thanks for joining us. And we've, we've certainly spoken about this here before, but you know, we're very much looking forward to the approval for vaccinations of five to 11 year olds. We are working with a number of partners involved in pediatric care to make sure that our clinics are appropriately designed to support uh, young children and young families. We are, you know, staffing up in advance of an announcement and we are working with families and children to make sure that uh, we've we've thought of uh, all of the potential aspects of this dotted I's cross T's. So we very much hope and expect to hit the ground running as soon as that announcement is made. The next question is from Jane Sims. Uh, Dr. Mackey, this one is for you. Uh, Dr. Mackey, can you give us an update on testing capacity at the Carling Heights Assessment Center? Are people still experiencing lengthy delays in getting tests and results? Thanks. Thanks for the question, Jane. The 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 delays are really around the testing capacity. Um, 
I, I'm not sure if Carol Young Mercy has more on the 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 wait time to get tested. Uh, this is a, a facility that's operated by LHSC. My understanding is that they were able to increase testing capacity by uh, 100 tests per day uh, last week, and we're planning to staff up and increase testing capacity further over the weekend. I'm not sure what the wait time is just now, but but I believe the lab wait time is is essentially within 24 hours, and that's certainly what uh, what uh, I'm hearing from the people that I know that have been tested recently. I, actually, I don't have more on that, but certainly we're looking to uh, make sure that there's not long waits. Um, the results should be coming back. There's no change in our capacity to do lab tests, uh, but we'll be responding to that uh, and the wait times. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Mackey. Thank you, Carol, as well. Uh, for uh, your answers and your insights. That does bring us to the end of our questions for this afternoon and just after two minutes of overtime. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, to Dr. Mackey, Mayor Holder, Warden Burkhart Jessen, and Carol Young Ritchie from LHSC, thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights as well and your information today and keeping us up to date on the latest developments with COVID 19 in London and Middlesex County. Uh, Dr. Mackey alluded to this earlier in today's briefing, and I just wanted to reinforce it. Our next virtual media briefing will not be held this Thursday, and that is because this Thursday, September 30th, is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, and the Middlesex London Health Unit will be closed. We will instead have our next virtual media briefing on Wednesday, so two days from now, Wednesday, September 29th at 2 p.m. We hope you'll be able to join us then. And one other announcement related to uh, September the 30th, and that is that the Health Unit's online dashboard will not be updated that day. So there will be no COVID-19 dashboard update on the Health Unit website on Thursday, uh, but there will be on Wednesday and then again on Friday. That does bring us to the end of our virtual media briefing for this Monday afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again on Wednesday at 2 p.m. So between now and then, have a great rest of your Monday afternoon. And so long for now.